Welcome back to the Get Unstuck and On Target podcast. I'm Mike O'Neill with Bench Builders, and we help growing companies, especially manufacturers, improve their people, process, and planning systems so they can scale smarter and faster. Joining me today from Portland, Maine, is Jim Swan. Jim is a personal development coach who is here to stress that there is life after failure. After struggling through a series of catastrophic professional and personal failures, Jim was certified as a coach and he launched James Swan Coaching. He coaches high achieving business owners and entrepreneurs to turn pain into fuel, mistakes into opportunities, and dreams into initiatives. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here with you today. Jim Pryor, we decided we're going to entitle this podcast that there is life after failure. And for those who go to your website, they begin to, to kind of read about your story. May we just kind of go ahead and set the stage. And that is you have found ways to take failure and it has really changed your entire trajectory trajectory. Would you mind kind of walking through our viewers and listeners a little bit about that journey, please? Be happy to, Mike. Be happy to. Thank you for the invitation to be here and to, to speak with you today. Um, the story is um, messy at best, um, painful at worst, hmm. but the good news about it is that it's in the past and it doesn't define me today. Um, I've learned innumerable lessons. I continue to learn lessons as we all do in life. Um, the thing I, I, I think the shift that has happened for me over the last five-ish years um, is coming to terms with the idea that I don't have to be afraid of my failures, that I can mm -hmm. embrace them, learn from them, create a, a new plan for forward motion, and then I can create a future in in my instance, a future that I never dreamt of and a future that is bigger and brighter and more fulfilling than anything that I have ever experienced before. And and really, I think at the end of the day, not beyond anything that I even imagined. So, um, so yeah, it starts with, um, I guess the, the first phase of it starts with a business failure in Los Angeles back in 2008, 2009, when the economy tanked, uh, my business tanked. And because I had done what many people did, and that was leverage personal assets, basically you know, put my house up, uh, took a second out on that. Um, two months later, when the when the, the real estate bubble in Los Angeles burst, um, that went away too, and mm -hmm. I was left with nothing. And there was one one well, it was the wee hours of the morning. Um, I found myself sitting on top of the high-rise building that I lived in with my feet dangling over the edge. Hmm. Trying to decide what the next step was going to be. Hmm. And, um, and fortunately, I didn't, I didn't take that final step at that moment. I had, I had two dogs that were running around behind me, two little, two little dogs. And I, I like to say that they saved my life that night because uh, they gave me a reason for climbing down off of that roof. And, um, and then I began a slog. Uh, it was a, almost a 10 year slog, Mike, um, trying to recover from that failure, which I, in the moment, I never really did. Um, and I stumbled into a couple of you know, different businesses. And at one point I landed, um, I landed in, on the idea of creating a podcast, not unlike what you're doing. Um, and I dove into it with a vengeance and I still had contacts in my then industry and, had an amazing time, almost three years of building a podcast that turned out to be very successful. And I really felt in that moment that I had, I had sort of found my place. Um, but while all, all of that was going on, I was, again, still sort of struggling financially because, of course, nobody gets rich, rich off of make, doing podcasting. Um, and so I was taking the occasional consulting job and just to make a, a long story slightly shorter, I screwed up. I um, misappropriated a client's money. I used it in a way that was not appropriate, was not the way that we had agreed that it would be used. Um, I did it 
That was a combination of ignorance because I've never been good with money um, and I've never really paid attention to them. I always had people in place to do that. Um, and at this point, it was just me. There was nobody to rely on. And I fumbled the ball. Uh, when I discovered what I had done or when I realized what I had done, um, I panicked, uh, scrambled a little bit thinking, well, I can recoup from this. I can you know, get the money back together and no one will ever know. And then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, um, I went to the client and I, I said, this is what has happened. And these are my plans. I'm, I'm going to pay this back, uh, which I began right away. Um, and during that payback process, they felt for reasons that I, well, they certainly never shared with me. Uh, but they felt that it was important to go to a local news station and mm. tell the story about what happened. And that ended up on the evening news, which of course means it landed on the internet. And uh, within 48 hours, uh, the podcast went away, the syndication deal went away. The 600 guests that had been on the podcast, I sort of became persona non grata to all of them and uh, a 16 plus year career in an industry that I loved um, evaporated and left me with nothing. I was at that point or shortly thereafter, I found myself sleeping on friends sofas up here in Maine and really, really hit a rock bottom. Uh, you know, I, I thought the rock bottom was when I'd lost the business in Los Angeles, but this was, this was rock bottom. And, um, and it was over the course of, the next months and, and really almost two and a half years into the process, um, I was gifted a coaching session hmm. by a friend, one of the few people that had stuck by me during those very dark times. Um, and he said, you know, I, I don't know if this will help, but you, you seem to be floundering and uh, this has helped me. So I jumped onto this call, not knowing what to expect. And while it didn't solve all the problems, it, you know, it wasn't a miraculous wave of the wand, but I came out of that 90 minute session for the first time in many, many years, believing that there was a light at the end of the tunnel, that there was a, a glimmer of hope. And that if I really buckled down and learned the lessons that the universe was not so gently asking me to learn, um, that maybe maybe there was a future for me and, and that didn't involve hiding that didn't involve being ashamed of who i was being ashamed of my past being ashamed of what i brought to the table and i dove into that as i tend to with things in my life i did it with with the podcast i dove in with a vengeance i did a daily podcast for over three years you know what's involved in in recording podcasts mike so it, do the math on that. Um, it was all consuming and I loved every minute of it. And I took that same energy and I poured it into what I now call my recovery period, um, where I learned how to recover from my failure. Um, in looking back on it and reflecting on it and writing a lot about it for my personal use, um, I I discovered that there were there were phases that I went through. There were steps that I stumbled into as I regained my life, or took my life back. Um, and I see now that those steps were leading somewhere and they were leading me to a place where I could once again connect with a dream and a vision of what my future might be. I had stopped allowing myself to do that. And I reconnected with that and I began to say, well, what if what would it look like if I did this? And what would life look like if I did that? And doors began to open and connections began to be made. And I found myself, you know, in a coaching program, a, a training, a coaching a licensing program. And here I sit today talking about my work as a, as a coach. I'm working with executives literally across the country and in a couple of instances around the world. Um, growing a coaching practice where every day I get to help people who have like, like I have stumbled in life and it can be any, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, Mike, we've all failed, whether it's, you know, having that donut this morning that you swore you weren't going to have because you were going to lose those 10 pounds, or maybe it's a relationship that's gone sideways and we found ourselves in a divorce court or maybe a business has failed or, you know, the list is long and we, we all know what those moments feel like. Nobody wants to talk about it, which I understand because it 
there's a lot of shame involved in admitting that we failed at something. And yet there is also a lot of freedom that can come in investing in the process of dealing with the failure and then charting a course for, for what the future might look like. So I'm here to, I'm here to tell people today that there is life after failure. Jim, you mentioned a moment ago that we don't want to talk about it. And that's in large part why I was drawn to have you uh, as a guest on this mm -hmm. podcast. And that is not only your willingness to talk about it, but the expertise that you have developed as a coach to help your clients do just that. And there's aspects of your story that I'm hearing for the first time. Um, as I was listening to you share, and I know you left lots of details out, but it sounds to me that you have experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And in, you mentioned LA in typical Hollywood fashion, we have a tendency sometimes to kind of make it real simple. Someone hits a, a setback and they buckle up and they kind of climb out of it. And it's a, a success story. Mm. What you shared with us is a major business failure that you thought was the worst of the worst, but that that set in motion. I love this word, a 10 year slog. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. that is a four letter word that, that almost tells it all. Yeah. Um, when you use the word slog, what does that feel like? What does that mean to you? What was your experience during those 10 years? Great question, Mike. Um, the experience felt like, as I, as I think back on it now, so my, my grandfather, a very wise man who unfortunately is not with us anymore, he used to have a, a, a term that he shared with us as kids uh, when someone would talk about being in a rut. Mm -hmm he would describe a rut as being a grave with the ends knocked out. Hmm. And so, so if you take that image and you overlay on top of it, muddy ground. So a grave with the end knocks knocked out and knee deep in mud. That's what the slog felt like to me. So for 10 years in muddy, muddy terrain up to my knees, sometimes deeper, I was trying to make my way out of this rut that I had found myself in. And the rut was that I was a worthless failure. That this mistake that I had made, this failure, this business that I had lost, or, you know, fill in the blank. We can all fill in that blank. Um, and it can be on a ginormous catastrophic scale or it can be on a relatively small scale. But the funny thing about failure is it all feels the same in the moment. Hmm. We all feel like we are less than, that we aren't worthy of, that there's nothing good that can come out of anything that we do. And that was the grave with the ends knocked out, knee deep in mud, that I found myself in and that I stayed in, not, not out of choice, but because I didn't know any better. I didn't know how to get out of it. And I think that's what, well, no, I, I'm going to correct that. I know that's what motivates me today in the work that I'm doing uh, as a coach. I came across the journal entry that I had made in one of my darkest hours um, after the, the podcast had gone away and after I had been publicly shamed and humiliated, uh, ostracized, you know, persona non grata from an industry that I had been deeply involved in. Um, and I was writing one night and I, I just over and over and over I wrote, if, if I could just talk to someone who could understand what I'm going through, mm -hmm. could have some point of reference, not to save me, not to cure it, not, I just, I needed to talk to someone who got what the pain feels like. And I, at that moment, I didn't have anyone in my life. And so I just slogged on. And so I approach this coaching experience that I'm now involved in as my opportunity to be that person for another human being. Um, co the thing I love so much about coaching is that it is a one-on-one -on -one experience. It's, it's in real time. It's one human being with another. In a pre-COVID world, it might even happen in, in the same room, but here we are 
uh, in, in a post-COVID world and we're using technology and it allows us to connect with people wherever they happen to be. But nonetheless, it's one-on-one -on -one, and it's me showing up and being present. And whether I say it out loud or whether it's just implied by my presence, I'm there because I know the pain that has been experienced by the other the person on the other end of that line. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to lay your head down on a pillow every night and not feel like you're worthy enough to wake up to a bright future. And, and my mission now today is to say that that doesn't have to be the case, that there are active things that you can do to move yourself out of that muck and mire and, and into a new life that can be so far, so far beyond anything that you could have imagined. Um, so yeah, there is life after failure. For those who are listening, they probably picked up on this, but most definitely those who are watching this via YouTube, when you transition to begin talking about your future, mm. you just lit up, <laughs> yeah. you started smiling and you're talking about a serious roller coaster that you are on, that essentially everybody is on. You have described hitting what you thought was rock bottom to have to do that yet again. And what is it you have to do? And that what you discovered in the process is that at least one person stuck by you. Yeah. And I don't know if the same person or not, but someone gifted you just that a gift of, of a coaching session. Um, my interest in inviting you as a guest, as you know, Jim, um, I too coach mm. and, um, I don't have the experience to the depth that you do when you're working with clients, can people just sense that in you, that you have been there, you've done that. Is there, is there something almost unsaid in your interactions with your clients? Wow. Um, I hope so. Mm -hmm. I hope that they're, wh whether it's through Zoom or th over the phone or on the odd chance that we're in a room together. I, actually, I think face-to-face -face in a room together, I think it becomes a little easier because I think I, I can communicate through body language a certain degree of empathy that that I think is a foundation of the work that I do. Um, I hope that it can come across. I believe it does. I ho certainly hope it comes across in a Zoom communication like we're experiencing today or over the phone. So I, I believe so. You know, I, I, I hear people, whether it was just out and about, I have overheard in my coaching training because we do uh, test sessions, you know, educational sessions where we're coaching peers. And I've heard people share stories about painful moments in their life. And I've watched the, the person filling the role as coach in that moment gloss over things that I would never have glossed over. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that there's a, a sensitivity, certainly an empathy, um, that I bring to the table that, that I hope distinguishes interactions with me. In many respects, as you describe prior roles, mm -hmm. you were a business um, owner an entrepreneur. And I know that you particularly work with high achieving business owners and uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. When I add that descriptive phrase, high achieving business owner or high achieving entrepreneurs, how does failure affect someone who might have been accustomed to high achievement? That's a great question. Um, I think in some ways, I, I was going to say that it's more painful, but I don't think that's correct. I think a failure for someone who is used to flying high used to achieving great things i think it's startling mm. and shocking in a way that 
is so out of the norm of their life experience, particularly if there's been a series of successes through their life, that if that's all they've ever known, and then suddenly to be thrown the monkey wrench of of this big failure, whatever it, whatever and however one defines that, I think the shock of that can be so disorienting that for many of the people that I work with, they're so knocked off balance that finding that place of balance again seems an impossibility. Mm. Despite their fat past successes, in some ways, it just feels a little more out of reach to them. And, but now the flip side to that is that the correct can often be remarkably fast because for many high achieving people, they understand the principles of learning from others, mirroring others' experiences that will lead them to a goal that, they're, that they've set out to achieve. And so when they're given, okay, step A, step B, step C, they hit step A, they're ready to move on to step B, on to step C, and suddenly things are very different for them. And so once they're able to unleash that energy that they've been used to, that has been derailed to some extent by this setback or failure, the recovery period, I, I, I remember reading an article a number of years ago about athletes who train and, and what they're training for in, in this particular instance was to shorten their recovery period, you know, to run a mile without any training and your recovery period is going to be X number of minutes before your heart rate can return to normal. And once you've trained then for a number of weeks or months, that recovery period becomes much, much shorter. And thus you are in better shape and more prepared for that challenge. And I'd like to, I'd like to think that that's what the, the people that I'm fortunate to work with bring to the table. They, they bring to the table an understanding of what that training means, of what hitting those training sessions or doing the work means to reduce that, the time that it takes to recover and to move into that next chapter. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I'm glad you brought that up because though your personal experience was one in which there were, the lows were over a long period of time. What I'm hearing you say is the nature of your coaching, what you've been specifically trained to do and where you're focusing on is that it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a long-term trough exactly. and that a high achieving person, one of the things they seem to have is the ability to kind of shake things off, meaning something happens good. They kind of shake it off and say, all right, what's next? But if they have the equal ability when something bad happens to basically say it happened and to shake it off, what I'm hearing is that you can help leaders potentially shake these things off by quickly and appropriately addressing the issues that need to be addressed. Does that comment make sense? It does, Mike, um, I, but I would underscore um, maybe something that you said, in, and that is that they have dealt with the real issue. Mm -hmm. Because just, just sort of acknowledging that something happened and moving on doesn't always equate into dealing with the underlying issues. Mm. You know, when when failure happens, there's always a reason. <laughs> you know, there's always a reason. Whether we're willing to honestly look at what the real reason is, own our part in it, not deny, not deflect, not ignore, not deny, I said that. Um, and take ownership of our part. Yes, maybe others participated, but we only can control our part in any situation. So owning that and then applying the principles of recovery, you know, that's the difference. Just acknowledging that it happened. I mean, one could build a case that you're doing nothing but just sort of burying it without actually addressing and solving the, the underlying issue. Does that make sense? I'm glad you clarified yeah. because um, when I say move on, it, 
that could be another phrase for burying it. Mm-hmm. And if, if one is not willing to understand and own what may be that root yeah. cause, then they're perhaps doomed to repeat that exact same thing again. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jim, I typically ask guests to share an example where either they or a client got stuck and what did it take to get unstuck? I mean, this whole conversation kind of fits that description to the T. Um, and that is you are sharing your personal experience and how you're using those personal experiences and that training to help others who may be dealing with the same thing. You mentioned um, root causes, and this is a maybe unfair question to ask. But when you're dealing with highly successful people who are dealing with a setback of some sort and they begin to better understand what might be that root cause, they might begin to own their role in it and going forward. Do you see any patterns emerge as to what might be root causes or is it all over the board? I think, I think in general, Mike, um, I think the root causes are as unique as each individual. Um, I mean, I suppose there are probably categories if we wanted to, you know, really do the research and start identifying things. Um, communication um, is a is a big category. Failures of communication can take us into some really really dark places that we don't want to go to. Um, Ignorance. For me, uh, you know, I was, I never have been, and I've never have, I have never claimed to be a whiz with numbers or a whiz with money. In fact, when I had my business, the joke around the office was, if it involves numbers, just keep it away from Jim because (laughs) it's a disaster, you know, waiting to happen. Uh, When I look back on that, I realized that I was making light of, something of my own ignorance and and maybe to some degree i mean maybe i would never be a, a mathematic whiz but i look again looking back on things i realized that i could have educated myself in a way that would have better prepared me to handle a situation that i didn't handle well and that caused a lot of pain and a lot of, of sorrow for for myself and for many other people um so so ignorance is another category um uh goodness um you kind of put me on the spot here but i mean this this is a really interesting conversation um i would i would say that there are broad categories that that things fall into for people but but everyone is a a little unique everyone would be a little unique in that regard yeah jim i've already commented to you before we hit the record button how much i enjoy reading your website Mm. because it clearly is not written by someone who doesn't know it's clearly got you and your fingerprints um all over it um i'm going to just read this because i just it spoke to me and and it kind of also speaks to as we kind of wrap up i want to give you a chance um to reflect on. So what I'll do, I want to hold off before I read from your website and mm-hmm. invite you, um, as you kind of look at our conversation, some of the things we've talked about, and you want to make sure that our listeners really hear certain things. What are those takeaways? Uh, I think that the, the most important takeaway from any interaction that I'm able to share with another person or people um, is the idea that and I've said it many times and I repeat it regularly, there is life after failure, that whatever thing you have stumbled over, whether it was falling off the wagon and, you know, eating that donut and blowing your diet, not getting to the gym the way you regularly, the the way you were determined to regularly go, whether it's a relationship that is tanking right now and that you're feeling guilt and shame over, whether it's a business deal that has gone sideways or a business in its entirety that is going or has gone sideways, it doesn't matter. You're not alone and there is hope. 
I think that, that would be the, the double pronged thing that I would want to underscore. You're not alone and that there is hope. For those out there who might get that sense that they may be alone and maybe you are finding hope elusive, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Uh, the easiest way to, to find me is the website, um, james-swan.com. Um, there's a, an easy contact form there. You can reach out there. There's, a, I believe the phone number uh, is posted on there. Um, make a call, shoot me a text, um, send me an email. Uh, it's jim at james-swan.com. Um, super easy. Don't forget the hyphen. The dash in there is important. I, I couldn't get the James Swan URL. Somebody beat me to it. Um, but uh, yeah, jim at james-swan.com or the website james-swan.com. That's the easiest place to find me. We obviously will include that in the show notes. Um, uh, we had the same issue with bench builders. We mm -hmm. had to add the dash in between to be able to claim that. Um, I would like to read this just because I just thought this was so well written. This is kind of kind of a call to action from your website and it reads are you ready to take the first step at this point you can follow one of two paths first you can move on without clicking the button below and continuing doing what you've always done and chances are you'll continue getting what you've always gotten you can continue to struggle with your goals and dreams and face the challenges alone or you can choose the second path you can choose to do something different to stop trying to figure out this all out by yourself and instead follow the lead of someone who has already figured out how to help achieve the things that you want badly. You know where you'll be in a year if you choose to do nothing, but there's no telling how far you'll go in life with an expert by your side guiding you every step of the way. If you're ready to change your life, I invite you to choose the second path click the button below and take the first step towards your best life ever. Jim, this is episode number 88. I've never quoted someone's website up to this point, but those paragraphs just resonates you. If I'm reading it and I'm now hearing your voice, uh, I have a, a much clearer sense of what you get when you reach out to, to Jim. So Jim, thank you for sh sharing your perspective. Thank you for sharing your heart and thank you for making it clear to everyone who's listening that there really is life after failure. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. I also want to thank our listeners for joining us today. We upload the latest episode to Apple, Google, and Spotify every Thursday. So if you've enjoyed this episode with Jim, please subscribe. Earlier, I shared that we love helping companies, especially manufacturers, scale faster and smarter. So if you're ready to solve those nagging people, process, or planning problems that are slowing your company's growth, if that's the yes, let's schedule a quick call. You can go to our website, bench-builders.com, or simply type unstuck.show in your browser. So I want to thank you for joining us. And I hope you have picked up on some tips from Jim that will help you get unstuck and on target. Until next time.